All right, guys, we're live. What's going on? This is uh, Plain to Win number 38. Uh, topic is uh, Lawyer Shares How to Reduce Taxes by Relocation. Um, to kind of frame this, and I've got David waiting in the green room area, but um, if you guys remember, it was, uh, I think it was May 23rd, which was about the uh, seven year anniversary of the channel. And I did a Plain to Win broadcast, just kind of uh, talking a little bit about where the channels come from and where I plan on going. One of the things I spent a lot of time on was um, I'm kind of fed up with um, the uh, high taxation rate in Canada, the socialist agenda, the uh, freezing cold winters. And um, somebody that knew me and David uh, personally did the introduction by email and said, Look, you got to talk to this guy. Um, you know, he's a tax lawyer or he was a tax lawyer. I'm going to get him to clarify that because I might be butchering that. But um, he has strategies and he helps high net worth individuals, uh, basically top shelf men, get out of their uh, countries that they're not happy uh, residing in and finding a place where they're essentially uh, treated far better by uh, the state and, you know, obviously the weather too. So um, I'll, I'll pull David in here and we'll get this thing rolling. David, welcome. How are you doing? Great, Rich. How are you doing? Yeah, yeah, th awesome. Thanks for you know carving out the time to do this. Um, so the plan is is we'll probably do forty five minute, like forty five to sixty minutes publicly on the channel. Um, because I've got some high net worth guys in my community, I've also posted the links there, and I think they've got the appetite uh, to come on and ask some private questions because I know that um, you've got some time for that as well. So we may switch over to that afterwards. I'm just keeping an eye on the uh, private Facebook group to see what the chat looks like and. Uh, how much uptake we have on it, but judging by the uh, likes on the posts that we're on for live right now, it's 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 there. So um, where should we start? I guess kind of like your Batman origin story is where I like to go. Like, sure, because you're originally from Canada, you now live in Europe. Um, you know, we kind of talked offline for a good forty five minutes about uh, three weeks ago or so. Maybe it was about two weeks ago. Yeah you know, about this uh, cast that we were setting up for. And we were talking about me personally and some of the strategies, but tell, tell all the viewers, you know, why you left Canada and how you got into this line of work. Sure. Uh, born and raised in Windsor. Uh, father was uh, in the auto industry, as most people are in Windsor. Uh, worked at, uh, for General Motors. Um, got a, Woke up in Canada, went over to the States. And what was quite common, and it's probably common in a fair number of border cities, is mom, when she would uh, start dilating, would go across to the States and be born dual citizens. And uh, back in the day, uh, she did that for my older brother and older sister. Uh, but the, by the time they got to me, the fact that they were RH incompatible kicked in. And so her ob guy said, you'd be having that kid in Canada. So myself and my younger sister, the only reason we weren't born dual citizens was the fact that my parents had incompatible blood. And so um, grew up in Windsor, kind of had the tax dual citizenship paid in one country, living in another, kind of at the breakfast table. Uh, going through law school, I needed a job. My father was implementing the auto pack for GM at that point, so he knew all the customs guys. Got a job at the Windsor Detroit Tunnel, mm -hmm. uh, where you tell all the Americans where all the bars and, and clubs are. And I used to look at the immigration people with their feet up reading novels. And I thought, oh, that's the job for me. And then we moved to Toronto and I worked at Terminal One um, going through, never thinking I was going to practice. It was just a great gig. Your customs kind of officer? Going, going through, uh, going through uh, uh, school. What is it that um, drags um, law students into customs officer work? Because I've noticed that. Like, I've, oh, it's just the money. the money. It's like easy work. You're just sitting there with a, a vest on stamping things and... Yeah, and, and you got lots of time between flights to you know, catch up on your reading and uh, uh, and things. And uh, you know, it's the it's the classic, of course, power uh, issue. You have an extraordinary amount of power at ports of entry. Much I more get to decide country. if you enter the country now. Absolutely, you're asking, okay. you're seeking my discretion. Right. And uh, uh, and then uh, got called to to the bar. I had a kind of commerce undergraduate background. I uh, thought I was going to be an international corporate lawyer, whatever that is. Sounded sexy. Girls yeah. liked it. Uh, worked for six months, and then they hit a recession. And as they do in uh, large firms, they said, well, what else can you do, kid? And I said, well, you know, my law school study partner went and worked uh, for Baker McKenzie, a big American firm in Hong Kong. He's been feeding me a bunch of Hong Kong clients since prior to the 97 handover. 
Mm -hmm. I got called in 1990. Um, I did my first U.S. expatriation, uh, Americans, which is what we'll get into here, in order to leave their tax system, have to, have to actually give up their U.S. citizenship if they're going to fully do it. Mm -hmm. um, and I was also on behalf mm -hmm. of uh, HSBC and uh, uh, British Bank Standard Charter, kind of running up and down the Gulf. If this is Tuesday, it must be Bahrain before, during, and after the Gulf War, uh, meeting private banking clients. Um, and so really did a lot of that, that very quickly figured out that, well, my first product was Canada, or my first tool or solution was Canada, given the fact that in, in Canada, the immigration ministry, quite frankly, is a, is a B team post. Every cabinet shuffle, there's somebody either on the way up or on the way down, They're changing immigration uh, ministers, you know, like a revolution in a Latin American country, mm -hmm. uh, constantly kind of changing. And so I thought I better learn some other stuff. And so this has gone three decades later to, I would call myself either a tax savvy immigration advisor or an immigration savvy tax advisor. So we look at, and, and whenever anybody in any of these jurisdictions, the first question they have to look at is how do I leave the current jurisdiction I'm at how do I jump out of that pot? And we don't want to make sure that they go into somebody else's fire. And how do I go into a, a, a situation where I've reduced my global tax burden? Well, I, I have at least maintained and hopefully increased my lifestyle. Mm. So that's kind of the end goal of the whole planning. Yeah. And, and to frame it a little bit further for you guys, so you understand tax burdens and the obligations you have when, when you're in the top of the... I mean, it's a sliding scale here in Canada. So if you're on the lower end, you might pay, I don't know, I think it's less than 30%, but on the higher end, like the top tax rate is 53% and change. And uh, you got 50% of capital gains, you get all these taxes on fuels. Like they just keep piling stuff on you and there's no end in sight. There's a new tax that they just introduced this year on luxury. They, they're calling it luxury vehicles, but essentially any uh, vehicle that costs over $100,000, it's, it's somewhere between 10 and 20%. So you can average it around 15, depending on what the final price point is of the vehicle. But you already have a 13% tax rate. So basically, it brings it up close to 30%. If you're a trades guy and you need a uh, F-250 pickup truck with a diesel to tow some stuff, uh, that's going to cost you over six figures. So they just keep throwing stuff out out at people. And the next thing that's going to come come along after that, that I've seen on the horizon is probably taxes on your principal residence for capital gains. I don't know if it'll be hundred percent or 20% or whatever that looks like, but uh, the government is incredibly irresponsible when it comes to um, budgeting and policies. They think money grows on trees. They print it up when they feel like it. And when, the, when it comes to budgeting and making things work, what they do is they just tax people. And because Guys that are chasing excellence, putting a dent in the universe, make more money. It's easier for them to vilify them and say, let's go get it from them because he drives a McLaren or and he's got a, a yacht, you know, at the Toronto Harbor sort of thing. And, um, you know, we'll redistribute that to the other people over there. So over the last couple of years, um, and I know you th that you didn't watch the cast, but your friend had mentioned it to you. But over the last couple of years, um, I've seen at least a dozen guys that are higher net worth individuals. So these are top shelf men that have done probably two or more exits with businesses, um, seven to eight figures. In one case, there was a nine figure exit and they were just like, I'm done. Canada is no longer home. Um, there's one in Puerto Rico. There's a few in Mexico. There's another guy that went down to Barbados and all of these different countries have um, ways to try to invite money and talent and resources to kind of invest into their country because it becomes useful to them, right? So there's an advantage for the country itself and the government there, and there's also an advantage to the guy moving his life to that place in the world. Um, so, I mean, I could bang on about this for a while now, but um, you moved to Europe. Why did you choose Poland? Well, Poland is actually the second time I left Canada. So the first time I left Canada was in the late 1990s. And... Um, I actually co-authored a book with a London School of Economic professor called Flight of the Golden Geese. Mm -hmm. And what countries like the ones you mentioned, and including a lot of high-tax countries which attract foreigners there on a lower tax basis, um, because they are that high-end tourist that they all spend tourism money to try to attract. 
they spend money, they hire people, they, you know, the consumer spending, if there's a VAT, they pay that, et cetera. So the way that they can attract them is by, you know, having a, a better tax burden than where they're at. And so I left this last time, uh, the month before Mr. Trudeau was elected the first time. Mm -hmm. um, I ended up uh, moving to Poland uh, because I had uh, recently gotten married to a, a woman who fell asleep on me on an airplane uh, who was of Polish descent. And we had just had uh, twins uh, and wanted to spend some time in Poland for the twins to learn the language. And we lived at the Ritz-Carlton in downtown Toronto, which is a wonderful place if you're an adult and sucks if you're a little toddler because there's no swings or, or playground within a kilometer of the place. You know, how many times can you go to the aquarium? Mm -hmm. We went a lot, but mm -hmm. you know, how many times can you go? Um, and, uh, and so we moved out and we happened to move in Poland, uh, which is very nice. And with, uh, with the pre-immigration tax planning, uh, very low global tax burden, uh, for me, uh, we have a business, uh, here that we're, we're finishing up. Um, my in-laws, this was the first time for them. So we've spent more time in Poland, especially we got kind of trapped here with COVID, but we're moving our next move, which was the one we've always planned either to the Algarve in, in Portugal or to the Mayan, uh, Riviera in Mexico. Mm. For and, us. and why Mexico? Like what's, uh, because a few guys I know have, have chosen Mexico as their destination. Why is it so popular? Well, you have to look at what, what's, what kind of not only makes sense from a, from a fiscal point of view, but also what you can sell at the breakfast table. So I'm in a position where I have seven-year-old twins. So mm -hmm. I'm going to be somewhere nine months of the year. Um, and so that, you know, then has to be, I'm, I'm not going to move to Pitcairn Island. Uh, that's not going to work. So it's going to be kind of where can we have, we can, from a pre-immigration tax planning, it's pretty straightforward from a immig uh, from an immigration having permission to live there. Pretty straightforward. So it's the lifestyle that that we're looking for. Mayan Riviera, of course, when people think of Mexico, you know, some people think oh, of of crime, and certainly there's crime in different places. Uh, I have a different sense of that, having grown up you know, next to Detroit when it was known as Murder City. So I know kind of there are nice places and places you don't want to go and how to be kind of street smart. And uh, Mayan Rivera is uh, very nice. Uh, lots of uh, the lifestyle that we want. Uh, there is the schools that we want, the housing that we want. And it's a little more low key um, than, you know, some of the, the, the places which would be a little more high pressure for kids. You know, when you're in Manhattan, Mm -hmm. The moment you get pregnant, you try to sign up for a preschool. It's a little intense, actually. When I met my wife, she was living in Manhattan, and uh, we both agreed, nice place to visit, but we don't want to raise kids there. And you set up your life and your business so that you're location independent. You can run it from pretty much anywhere in the world, right? Correct. So I've been doing this for quite a while. Actually, when COVID hit and people all of a sudden discovered Skype and Zoom and things, they, they came to my lifestyle that I've had. Uh, you know, for a decade. Uh, so it's been actually quite good. I used to be Philly as fog and have to travel all the time because people wouldn't hire me unless they, they saw me. Well, now, you know, it, it, I, I have Silicon Valley clients who I'm getting a lineage citizenship for and a residence for them in New Zealand. And uh, I've got several billionaire clients who I've never actually been in the same room with. Mm -hmm. But you get to know so much about them and it's not that the ability to do it, it's their comfort with it uh, has people have, have gotten a lot more comfort with advisors and people online. And they can kind of quickly figure out who knows what they what they know. And, you know, the, 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 the higher end clients also have teams of advisors. So they quickly can kind of separate the, the wannabes from those who really know what they're doing. And I'm not saying I'm I'm a genius, but if you do anything for three plus decades, you get pretty good at it. What have you noticed as a general trend with um, these people that are leaving Canada, you know, the United States, and moving themselves to these countries um, that purportedly will treat them better on the uh, tax levels? Like, is there a common theme that you've noticed in their lives? Sure. So, so one of the things to understand is the 
revenue model of a progressive tax, tax system, whether you think it's fair or not, what ends up happening is the top 1% account for anywhere from a third to 40% of the total tax revenue. Mm. So the government needs money. If you, th- if you run any type of business and, and one out of 100 of your customers is bringing in a third to 40% of your revenue, you kind of want to know about those customers. Well, if you think of those customers, they are people who much more tend to be location independent. They can run their business from, they don't have to be standing on the shop floor overlooking somebody. Um, They have skills, et cetera, which they can either put online or they can manage their money online. And so they're much less sticky from a business point of view. The result is you only need a small number of those golden geese, as we call them, to leave, to have a huge negative asymmetric impact on the total tax revenue that they the, the subtitle of our book was how the 1% affect the 99%. Well, you only need a small number of the 1% to leave, to leave a huge hole in, you know, the, the, the government revenues for those left behind. And that's, so the trend I've really seen is that people are, are really discovering their mobility. Um, we've probably all seen the, the kind of little map of Manhattan, like the center of the world, and you know a few bridge and tunnels over to New Jersey, and the rest of the world's kind of very small. And you had people, whether they were in Manhattan or Toronto or London or Silicon Valley, who had very, you know, cultivated lives. They really lived within five square blocks. They went to the same restaurants. They went to the same work. They, you know, socialized with the same people. They had the same amusements. And they, they couldn't really dream of overcoming this life inertia. Well, COVID came in and they were kind of kicked out of town mm-hmm. one step ahead of COVID. And they were sitting up there in the Hamptons or somewhere else and sitting there going, listening to the New York City mayor race. And they're all talking about how they're going to crank up the, the tax rate there. Or people are sitting and listening to, you know, um, uh, Mr. Trudeau and his deputy prime minister who wrote a book called Plutocrats. Christia Freeland, and you know the equivalents in different ger- different other countries, and they started saying, "What's well, that book about, by the way?" Sorry, what's that? What's that book about, by the way? I've not heard of it. Plutocrats. Yeah, uh, it's Christia Freeland talking about how the rich are ruining the the world for the rest of us. Oh, okay. So it's the richest <laughs> fault again, of course. Yeah. Um, and so you know, so these people are sitting there saying, "Well." You know, honey, um, our favorite restaurant, there's this thing called Uber Eats. They'll deliver it to our door. And there's this, you know, Google Teams and Zoom and Skype. And, you know, we've got out of Manhattan and the world didn't collapse. And, you know, I, we can actually reproduce our lifestyle. And mm-hmm. now I've got this, the distance that I'm listening to what, you know, and now the frog has jumped out of the water. And they're now going, that's pretty hot water. I don't know if I want to go back in. Yeah. And so then they start thinking about... <clears throat> Okay, well, we've already got a place in Florida. Let's relocate to Florida. So that's where you see, you've seen the max exodus of people, the high-end people from New York who went went to Florida. And New York City has a city surtax. And so it's seen a 40% drop in their projections for tax revenues simply because some of the people have, have picked up and moved to Florida. And you'll get, and one of the key things to understand today is you need to really do it. I've had some people saying, well, you know, I'm not really going to move to Florida, but they'll never know. And then I'll say, you do have a cell phone, right? Yeah. That's pinging off a tower every second or so. And they know exactly where you're at. I mean, just like the visitors to the uh, the Capitol on January 6th, the police figured out where they were at. Well, they're going to figure out, you know, that you're standing in New York at going to your favorite bodega buying, you know, your milk and, and cookies. Um, so they're very good. And the onus is on you to prove that you've moved to Florida. It's not on the, on the tax authorities to move that, to prove that you haven't left New York. And so that's where you need proper kind of advice you need to execute, but the opportunities are tremendous because people can much more reproduce their lifestyle independent of a specific location than they could in the past. Yeah, it's, you know, it's bizarre to me. And I, I'm glad that you mentioned that point about uh, like how much of an impact it has in the tax system when 
high net worth individuals just pick up and move and just take everything with them to another place because that because that does affect the less fortunate folk because there's less money to um i guess steal from the rich and give to the poor sort of thing how uh, what kind of effect does that have on the economy like over the longer term oh a huge effect there you have to look at um if we look at canada australia the uk for example all of those jurisdictions have a vat tax a gst mm -hmm. hst the united states does not so the united states when you look at the total kind of pie of their government revenue they don't have that vat wedge so that's why the united states it's actually even higher um uh, a, a greater dependence. So you just need a much smaller number to leave and they've got a, a huge impact. So when you have people like Elizabeth Warren who are saying, well, you know, we're not, it's the, the rhetoric move from let's get money for good stuff to let's take money from bad people. Well, you know, <laughs> that doesn't go over very well at, at the negotiating table. And, and many of my clients are sitting there saying, yeah, I can contribute more. I will, but you know, when you start the conversation with selling beer mugs, saying billionaires tears, mm -hmm. that's not a very productive conversation. So thank you very much. I'm going to leave and, and I will decide what's going to happen to that money, whether to lifestyle, whether to my children, whether to strategic philanthropy. I mean, uh, uh, it was very revealing this past week when ProPublica produced his stuff, they asked Warren Buffett and he said, well, course it makes more sense for me to give it to a charity than to give it to the u.s government mm -hmm. and um is the main reason to lower taxes is it because they're fed up with state policy and the liberalization of the west is it a combination of that like it, it's a combination of things so each country has its own particular you know issues in the united states uh you know it, it, it's certainly been political dysfunction, um, an increasing sense of uh, societal violence, um, a, 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 a very polarization uh, of the population, and a sense that government doesn't kind of work. So let's contrast that, for example, with Switzerland. Um, and, you know, People who talk about wealth taxes, for example, they all, you know, everybody says, well, all these other countries, it's not working. And they go, well, it, Switzerland has kept it, you know, let, let's follow Switzerland. Well, Switzerland, you have to understand, is a federation. However, all the power resides at the cantonal level. A canton is the size of a, the biggest cities are Geneva and, Z and Zurich. I mean, these are only cities of a couple hundred thousand people. Most cantons are less than 100,000 people. Is a so canton can't... the same thing as a city-state or similar to that? Like a province. Okay. So, so, and all the power resides at the provincial level. Mm -hmm. And so that canton, they vote on what the wealth tax rate is. They collect the wealth tax and the wealth tax is spent in that community. So it's much more akin to a property tax. Mm -hmm. People say, yeah, I, I accept that because I can see it built the community center and it it built the roads and it built all the things that I can actually see have, have positively impact. And so that's why there's a lot more acceptance. Whereas when you get into larger countries where monies are going into the general coffers, you know, you can have politicians saying, oh, well, you know, we're going to, we're going to spend it all on, uh, you know, uh, on, on puppy dogs and, and, and flowers, but it doesn't go to that. The way money's going to the general coffer, there's then first goes to pay interest on the debt. Then it goes to non-discretionary spending. Then it go, if anything's left, then it goes to discretionary spending. And maybe it'll go to that societal ill that you want to, whether it's early childhood education or cancer research or whatever it is. So one option is to use the government as a charitable vehicle. Well, not terribly efficient or effective. Or the other is I'm going to affect, you know, once I've got my lifestyle money, my children's money, you know, I can't take the rest with me. Um, I'm going to uh, engage in strategic philanthropy, and I don't think the government's a very good vehicle. Thank you, Mr. Buffett, for the quote. Mm -hmm. And he is going to donate it to the societal ills that he thinks uh, are important. 
and he knows that that will be dealt with effectively or efficiently. Why, um, why do you think it is that the like government officials, these bureaucrats, these politicians, aren't able to understand that guys that are like one of the things that drives me nuts is I can go and take the risk of buying a stock uh, pre IPO. There's one that I bought in that's in the psychedelics field that I bought at a very low entry point. I took all the risk. There was no proven uh, you know point that this company was going to take off. Um, and they don't have the regulatory approval uh, really to justify piling money into it. But I like the guys running it. I know they've had successful exits twice. I know that they work hard. Um, and I believe in what it is that they're doing. So I've taken the risk. I can go throw it all in there. And maybe it turns into a, a mill or two, you know, and I make some serious money off it. Um, and then the government just comes along and says, oh, that's cool. I'll just take half of that now. Right. You know, they've done no work. They've taken no risk and they just take like, why is it that you think that the government doesn't get it through their heads that guys aren't going to let themselves be treated like tax cattle over and over again um, and redistribute money in a frivolous fashion? Like one of the things that I think was announced since the G7 summit is Justin, Justin Trudeau mentioned um, that they're going to be uh, distributing vaccines, COVID vaccines to uh, less fortunate countries at I think they're spending something like twice or two and a half times the rate as what the U.S. is. And our population in Canada, for those of you that don't know, is something like 10% of the U.S. So Justin Trudeau has basically unilaterally decided, I'm just going to take some money that I've stolen from people and I'm going to send it outside of the country to benefit these other people here. Um, you know, So I've got a whole bunch of problems with that. Why is it you think that the government doesn't get that People that have done work and taken risks in their lives and put a dent in the universe aren't going to let themselves be treated like tax cattle. Because they have allowed themselves to be treated like tax cattle for too long. Mm. And they also, it doesn't benefit the politician. Politicians, you're only going to be one vote, Rich. Right. There's going to be 99 other votes. You know, uh, taxation in a democracy is kind of like nine wolves and a sheep voting over what's for dinner. Right. Uh, and, and, and that's the way it is. Is it unfair? Absolutely. So the question is not whether it's unfair or not. The question is, what are you going to do about it? And you have a bunch of tools that you can use to organize your life so that you can say, this is the life I want. I'm going to arbitrage the things I like, whether that's weather or lifestyle, or infrastructure, or, you know, a, a wide variety of things, so that I can have those things at the, you know, uh, at the best possible, um, you know, a uh, uh, cost to me. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I, I don't spend a lot of time trying to think about how I'm going to convince, you know, a large population of people uh, to think like I think, I'm going to just spend the time to recognize that's the way they are. And I'm just going to organize the, my life. And there's a lot of opportunities in the modern world to do that so that their negativity has a minimum impact on my life and that of my family. Okay. Well, let's um, switch gears a bit and talk more about destinations and um, why they're attractive to um, guys looking to minimize their tax burdens and have a lot more personal freedom. I mean, we talked off the air a couple of weeks ago. Um, I mentioned to you and I can, you know, repeat it again. I also mentioned it in the plane to win cast from that time as well. It was around May 23rd. If you guys haven't seen it, you can go back and watch it. But essentially, I've got an eight to 10 year plan. So I've got some runway. Um, I've made the mistake in the you know the past of my life, and of course, this is stuff that you learn as a man as you get older, and you become more seasoned, and you've got a little salt and pepper in the beard, um, and you can plan better. You know, you make less knee jerk, you know, decision, you know, decisions, and this is something that I want to take my time on. So, this is kind of the early steps for me. Um, I've got about eight to ten years simply because my daughter's not an adult yet. So, you know, I'm mm -hmm. doing I'm doing the right thing, and. Um, you know, uh, being that full-time parent, obviously, you know, we share custody. So you're familiar as a lawyer, the child goes back and forth in a, you know, in a shared sort of fashion. 
And um, at some point, you know, I want to spend a lot less time in Canada. I want to not pay the ridiculous tax rates that I'm having to pay. I don't want to deal with the liberalist agenda, the wokeness, the virtue signaling, all that nonsense and the cold winter. So for a guy like me that probably needs to stay within a reasonable distance from Toronto because you're going to be traveling back and forth if you've got family here, especially a child or grandkids, you know, as time goes on, whatever. Um, it wouldn't be ideal for me to go somewhere like Asia, Eastern Europe. So I'm thinking somewhere in the Caribbean and there's a few different options down there because most places down there are roughly a four hour flight. Uh, I've been really keen on the idea of, of maybe getting a, a sailboat and sailing around the Caribbean or maybe even the world at some point. Um, what would be the ideal destinations for me to consider at this point, given all those things that we just covered? Sure. So there's a couple of considerations. As I said, the first thing you have to consider is where you're leaving from. So Canada says, okay, in order for you to not no longer be a tax resident in Canada, you need to, in the future, spend less than 183 days in Canada. You also need to centralize your mode of living outside of Canada. And the best example I, use, I like to use is, you know, when do you become resident in Canada? Well, when does water become soup? You add certain key vegetables, like a home, where a spouse is, where your children are, those are major vegetables, you'll have soup. You can add some other minor vegetables like a car, club memberships, things like that. So Canada says, well, you, you can get rid of your, your house. Your daughter is now off to university, so no longer in your house. You don't have a spouse or your spouse is moving with you to, somewhere. Um, so you've got rid of those ties in Canada, but you have to get them somewhere else. So in the case of Canada, for the first two years to have clearly left, you'll want to get so what we'll call a pied de terre, a home, whether you buy it or rent it, whether that's in Ambergris Key in Belize or Turks and Caicos or, 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 or Nassau, um, that's fine. Once you have clearly severed your time in Canada's eyes, and two years is kind of the working working time, then you can get rid of that thing in Nassau and live completely on your boat. And so long as in the future, you don't spend more than 183 days in Canada or reacquire those main things in Canada, home and spouse or child in that, that home, then you're, you're done with Canada. And the moment you're finished with Canada, it's as if you're dying to the Canadian tax system. So you have a deemed disposition for capital gains purposes. So there, given the runway you've got, Rich, you've got lots of time to do planning to minimize the impact of that departure. So there's a, you know, there's a whole bunch of solutions that you can do from, is it pre-IPO? Do I get discounting opportunities? What is the, what is the exemption, small business exemptions? If you're in the States, you have QSOPs and all kinds of different things that you can do. So each jurisdiction you have to kind of look at, what do I need to leave? For an American, they need to, to they can move abroad. And if they establish what's called a foreign tax home, they can get an exemption uh, it's called a, a section uh, 911 exemption on their first, there, there's a, a earned income. It has to be earned income as opposed to income, passive income, for example. And then you get some other things, about $100,000 once you include all the housing and all the other things you can get in. And people say, okay, I got 100000 free of the U.S. I only pay on everything above that. That's fine. For those people where it's not enough, and they want to be completely free of U.S. filing and taxation and, and planning, then they need to get another citizenship and give up their U.S. citizenship. Mm -hmm. Australia has, has actually just recently changed their rules. You know, Australia used to be quite a sticky wicket. Now it's much more straightforward. Uh, the U.K. has particular rules. And you also have to look at what are they taxing? Canada taxes income and capital gain. United States taxes income, capital gain, gift, and estate tax. The UK doesn't have a gift tax, but they have an estate tax. Some jurisdictions, most of them will have income and capital gain. Some of them will have wealth. Some of them will have gift taxes. Some of them will have estate taxes. So you have to kind of understand that part. Then where are you going to, so we've effectively, we've efficiently left you, jumped out of the Canadian pot. Where do we, where do you want to go? Well, for some people, they say, you know, 
uh, I got that place in the Bahamas. I'm going to keep that for two years. I'm going to live in a boat. I'm going to travel around. I don't, I'm not going to spend more than six months anywhere. Therefore, I'm not going to jump into somebody else's tax system. If you're somebody like me, it says, yeah, I got little kids. I'm going to be somewhere nine months of the year. So I have to think about the new place I'm in and make sure I shelter myself from that, from that tax system. Now I can shelter myself a variety of ways. It may be a low or zero tax jurisdiction, NASA or Barbados, for example. It may be a jurisdiction which says we only tax you on local source income. So fine, I'll keep all my money and my income and capital gain producing assets outside of that jurisdiction. Others will say you need to apply for and meet certain standards. For example, Portugal has something called the non-habitual tax resident certificate. Other jurisdictions like Ireland, UK, Malta, Cyprus, they say, well, we have something called a remittance basis where we only pay on local tax or on foreign, current foreign income you've taken your hands. Other places say, you know what? Write a check, lump sum. So that would be Switzerland, Italy, and Greece. They have what's called a lump sum. So whether you make a dollar or a hundred million, you're gonna pay a hundred thousand euros to Italy or Greece. Um, in Switzerland, it's negotiated again at the cantonal level. So you'll pay more if you negotiate a forfeit in one of the major cities like Geneva. Zurich doesn't have it. And that's an interesting little story. But if you say, you know what, I ski. So I'm going to go up to another place. Um, Zurich, about nine years, the residents of Zurich, the, the left has said, oh, well, it's terrible that these foreigners come in here and pay a lump sum and, you know, it's not fair and they campaigned and they just squeaked by and they walked, they, 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 they uh, brought the referendum and, and, and they won and they got rid of the forfeit in the canton of Zurich and all the left said, oh, this is great. Everybody else is going to do this. Not only did nobody else do it, but all the wealthy people in Zurich went up the road to Zug which is now the crypto valley. Mm -hmm. So they're actually going to have another referendum saying, yeah, that was not a bad system. Let's bring back the forfeit into Zurich. So, mm. you know, when, gotcha. when you've got voters who understand and politicians who are not, you know, can you, can anybody name the president of, of Switzerland? I don't no. know. What it is. No. Pretty, no, because they're, it's kind of like a non, can you, you know, can you name the capital? Mm-hmm. It's Bern, but you know, is anybody? I thought it was Zurich, but Bern? okay. Yeah. yeah. Um, so it, it's just it's you know there isn't pomp and circumstances. All it's kind of like you know a, a local politician. They're not you know aggrandized as they are in in other high tax countries, and that's why Switzerland works. If so that's the lifestyle for you. So I have a question here for my buddy Bobby, um, and he can't attend the uh, private call, but he's saying, what are the best countries to relocate to that don't require you to live there two thirds of the year in order for you to pay as little as tax legally possible? He's currently in the US, uh, he lives in Michigan. Um, it sounds to me like it's not where you go to pay little taxes, it's, it's, it's the amount of time that you're not in your country of residence that you're leaving, right? Absolutely true, except for one, one exception, which is the Puerto Rico option. So All right, Puerto yeah. Rico has had Act, used to be Act 21 and 22, is now Act 60, where you have to, um, where if you go there, not only do you have to minimize your time mm -hmm. in the United States, you have to actually spend 183 days on the island Puerto of Puerto Rico. Rico. Right. Um, and so <laughs> what happened is after the fiscal crisis, John Paulson uh, of the big short fame um, bought a big uh, a resort. And everybody said, well, Paulson's the smartest guy in town. We'll, we'll follow him. And they all went to Puerto Rico. The problem is that didn't sell well at the breakfast table for a lot of people moving from Manhattan to Puerto Rico. Nice enough place. But when the kids come home and going, you know, dad, I, um, not working. None of the kids speak English. And I don't know. I've never kicked a soccer ball in my life. Uh, and, you know, there's two hurricanes here. And there's there was an earthquake. And, you know, if you can't live it then it's going to be difficult. So I was getting a call from a lot of those people. They'd overcome the life inertia of being where, you know, in Connecticut or in, in Manhattan and they moved to Puerto Rico, but they found it difficult to live there. And the, the advantage, if you could, was that you got federal capital gains free and there wasn't no state capital gains. So it was very good for people who get 
a lot of capital gains, like fund managers get something called carried interest. Um, unfortunately, a lot of people couldn't live the lifestyle. So they did one of three things. They hired me and they expatriated and left Canada or left the United States. Um, they moved back into the United States and gave up that tax advantage. Or they thought, eh, nobody's auditing me. I'm not going to, they're not checking. You know, oh, I'm, I fly privately. They never know. It's like, mm -hmm. well, no, dude, they, they, <laughs> your pilot fly files a, 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 a flight a, plan, yeah, who's flight on plan and yeah. that pilot that you've been kind of abusing is sitting there saying, well, there's a whistleblower reward if I turn over this guy, mm -hmm. uh, et cetera. So actually uh, about a week and a half ago, Bloomberg did a whole article talking about coming to Puerto Rico, IRS is waiting for you. And I, you'll probably see me quoted in a follow-up article because the IRS is focusing, they're going to fish where the fish are and they're going to turn over that rock and they're going to discover a whole bunch of people who thought they were being cute, who not only are going to get slapped with, with the actual tax, but with all the penalties and the willfulness and they'll lord tax evasion over them and get all the settlements. So it's going to be ugly. Mm. Puerto Rico, great if you can live the lifestyle. Right. You know, um, you have. But for you, Rich, it would be, you know, what's the cheapest place that you can get somewhere for, for two years? Yeah, like what should I be looking at? Because I want to go and walk about, you know, check out a few different countries. So I, they have to I would say where I like to live. So, so the, the cheapest like I'm big on Mexico. Like I love Mexico. I visited Barbados, not a big fan of Barbados. There's yeah. other Caribbean islands that I like too, but Mexico I've always been fond of. Well, Barbados is, is south. It's a, yeah. it's a long flight. It's a seven hour flight from Toronto. Yeah. It's a much so, longer flight. Um, you know, Mexico, Costa Rica, um, Belize, they all have their variations of what are called pensionero programs. Mm -hmm. So that you're, you're getting the right to live in those jurisdictions you basically have to show that you've got enough money to sustain yourself at pretty minimal levels. Um, Was that like hundred grand, two hundred grand? Like, what do they look for? Oh no, you you you, you would show that you've got an annual monthly of, of five thousand available to you. Okay, so it's pretty small. Yeah, and so you, you, and if you say I don't like Belizean banks, that's fine. You say I've got the your your ass doesn't need to be where your assets are. Right. Yeah. You mentioned that on the call. Actually, you know what I wanted to touch on uh, before I forget, because you told an interesting story about a uh, Kuwaiti family during the war that mm -hmm. um, they had assets tied up. And I think you made an argument for having multiple passports because of that. Yeah. So if you can think back to, to 1990, when Saddam invaded, invaded Kuwait, he invaded in August. August in Kuwait is not a fun place. It's like 45 Celsius. So the only person left there was, you know, poor cousin Iqbal who drew the short straw. Everybody else was in London, Paris, Montreux, New York, you know, enjoying the summer. So I had a client who was going to buy um, a, a condo in Toronto there. And put I was with a big firm in Toronto at that point, put the monies on in, in escrow. You know, we were going to pay it out as, as per the construction milestones. And uh, he was in in um, in London at uh, the Mandarin Oriental, and you know had a number of people there and spent money freely. Mm -hmm. And he called me up and said, "Oh my God, the the Americans and the Brits have frozen all of the Kuwaitis' assets because they don't want us to be subject to." to having to pay kidnapping ransom to, to bail out cousin Iqbal. And so he said, what am I going to do? I said, well, you happen to have 5 million Canadians sitting in our firm trust account, walk away from the deal and I'll pay your bill. So I would send money to the Mandarin Oriental. Now, I don't know about you, Rich, but I can last a while on 5 million Canadian, but mm -hmm. I don't have an entourage or, yeah, he had a big family. Lifestyle. Said, right? yeah, yeah. And, and of course, we didn't know when Saddam was going to be leaving. So mm -hmm. the lesson for, for him is it all worked out in the end was you want to have monies available to you in, in, in multiple jurisdictions. You want to have citizenships, multiple passports, because what had happened if there had been, 
you know, a takeover like there was in Iran? Uh, what if there's a takeover in, in a lot of countries um, and they cancel your passport? The thing to remember about your passport, no matter what country it is, look on the inside cover, it's not your passport. It's the property of Canada, the US, Australia, Kuwait, wherever, that they let you use right up to the moment that they don't let you use it. So if they want to go after you, Jack Ma, they'll cancel your Chinese passport. If you haven't got another passport, you're not going anywhere. So there's an argument for having more than one passport when, you're, when you've become a top shelf individual, right? Uh, absolutely. And, and it's not only, and I always, I think uh, I was telling you the story, I always have to preface this with myself and my siblings didn't go out nightclubbing looking for Europeans. <clears throat> but as it turned out, my, my older sister married a Latvian, my brother married an Italian, I married a Scotswoman and on a pole, and my younger sister married an Irishman. Now, I'm the only one to actually use the passport and go and live abroad. But all of my nieces and nephews have done everything from kind of a gap year to school to, you know, I've got a niece that's lived in Brussels for, uh, I think, seven or eight years now. Um, and so it's something that citizenship is not only an insurance policy, but it's also something as an opportunity. And one of the things for, for Americans, and by that I mean the North Americans, Latin Americans, and uh, or Central Americans and, and South Americans, those were all immigration destination countries in the, the 19th and 20th century. So a lot of people have claims to a lineage citizenship, and that's a pro low-hanging fruit. And people might say, well, you know, but I don't want to live in Lithuania. Well, no, it's because of the Treaty of Rome, that Lithuanian passport doesn't just give you access to Lithuania, it gives you access to 26 other countries. And so if you've got that family heritage, that's very valuable. How valuable? Eric Schmidt, formerly of Google, didn't have that. Guy laid out 3 million euros for a Cypriot passport. Doesn't want to go live in Cyprus. But if he's bailing out of the U.S., he's going to go live in Switzerland or Italy or Greece on a, on a lump sum. So... Um... So speaking of which, so I was born in the United Kingdom. My dad's uh, British. My mom's Greek. She was born, I think my mom was born in Egypt, if I'm not mistaken, but she grew up in Cyprus, Lebanon, and Greece, and Egypt for some part of her life as well. Um, are there any like shortcuts that I should consider as far as, like I've already got a British passport, so, you know, it's expired. I just have to go and do the renewal thing, obviously, but are there any other um, you know, considerations that I should place over this eight to 10 year plan where I might want to acquire other passports or consider other countries of residencies because it, because it allows you like a backdoor entrance to another country because of whatever. A absolutely. So with that kind of, so uh, you know, people have very fact situation, fact specific situations and uh, if they don't already have the citizenship. So, you know, the question is, are you entitled to a Greek? or possibly even a Cypriot passport. Um, so what client, what I have people do is send me an email with their basic facts. I run through and say, well, if we can get the documents to show, prove this, you will qualify. So I do that kind of assessment for free or no, you're not gonna, you're not gonna qualify. Mm. If we think that they are gonna qualify, the first step is we, we get a professional genealogist to make sure the documentation is available. And of course, one of the practical problems in certain parts of Europe as a result of the First and Second World War is, is the records just aren't available. But mm -hmm. can we piece together the records not from when they left, but when from they arrived in Halifax or New York or Boston or, or you know, Buenos Aires or wherever they were coming into? Um, and so we, if we can, if you, 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 you clear, yeah, it looks like you qualify, we can actually prove it and then we submit the application. Rich, you may be happy living on a boat sailing around the Caribbean, but you've just opened up the opportunity for your daughter and your daughter's future children to go live, work, and study not only in the UK, which you've got as a result of, but because of Brexit, you've still got the other 26 or 27 EU countries that you can that she can go to. Mm. Quite a valuable thing. Okay, so it's worthwhile doing that then. Um, 
Let me just uh, catch up here on some of these super chats because some guys have been posting some questions and comments here that are relevant to the to the cast, and uh, then we'll kind of start to wind down and we'll switch it over to that Zoom link for the community and, and talk in some depth on some other stuff. Um, what we got here to do? Uh, Captain Herring says, "I think the giveaways are to win favor with Biden's woke agenda. It's easy to spend OPM other people's money. It's." Yeah, I mean, it, it's an easy way to yes. get votes. Yes. <laughs> and, you know, trees fall in the forest. Yeah. yeah. Mexican Iron Man says, my tax firm has served U.S. businesses owners for 16 years, and Mr. Lesperance is 100% accurate. FYI, I moved my firm headquarters to South Carolina, away from California, and South Carolina gas sales income, ETC. Taxes are much lower. Great show. Thank you, sir. Um, that's the interesting thing about the U S is you actually have opportunities to still be American and live within the U S and pay more preferable tax rates. Whereas in Canada, it's like one or 2% different depending on what province you live in. I think, in Al I think Alberta has probably the best rates in Canada, but it's not much different, right? Like we don't have that advantage here, do we? Yeah. You, you don't have the big spread. You don't have the big Delta you have, you know, between California and Texas or New York and Florida. Uh, that you do between, you know, Quebec and, and, and Alberta. Um, I tell clients to think of, you know, the current environment kind of like being in a wildfire zone. So what do you do when you're in a wildfire zone? Well, you engage in fire prevention. Those would be domestic tax planning for in the States, for example, that would be moving from a California to a South Carolina or to a lower, lower tax jurisdiction. You've eliminated at least the state level of taxation for that. It may be doing things like in the U.S., uh, they have a gift in the state tax. So there's something called a unified credit right now, 11.7 million. With Bernie Sanders and Elizabeth Warren, it's not going to stay at 11.7 million. So you may want to make that earlier now. Uh, you got a great company called Zoom that went through the roof. I'm going to do something called a GRAT. There's a whole, you know, I, I'm a founder of a Silicon Valley company. I'm going to accuse, before it gets to 50 million, I'm going to do a QSOP. I mean, again, this is all the normal domestic tax planning. The other thing you do along with fire prevention is you get fire insurance. And that's that alternative citizenship, alternative residence. When you buy fire insurance, it doesn't mean you're going to actually use it. It just means that you recognize that if the fire gets too close for your comfort, you've got an option to avoid your fiscal house burning down. And for other clients, what's the fire escape plan? You know, we in, in, in Canada, it is a, a deemed disposition. In the United States, if you're what's called a covered expatriate, which is you have more than $2 million in worldwide assets, or you have more than 172 million 172,000 in average US tax paid over the last 5 years you're going to be subject to a deemed disposition but do you want to get out now well the top federal rate is 23.8% with the obama surcharge or do you want to wait until mr biden comes in and it's 43.4% federal and then if you're still in the state you're going to add the state on top of that now he's proposed that He's also come out with what's called the Green Book, which is these are the proposals. What's the effective date? And he chose April 28th. That's aspirational. It's not yet the law. I actually had a client, Silicon Valley guy, who expatriated and was deemed to have sold all the stuff the day before. So I sent him a little mem of, of Indiana Jones sliding under a rock and reaching back and grabbing his hat before it came in. I mean, that's pretty close. But for a lot of clients, from a practical viewpoint, it will probably be from uh, January 1st, 2022. So that means you can get out now. Well, it's 23.8%. Elizabeth Warren's ultra-millionaire tax says you'll not only pay the capital gains tax at whatever the rate is, 23.8 or 43.4 whatever you have left we want 40 cents on the dollar so thank you elizabeth warren you put you know a lot of hot wheels in my kids rooms and 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 barbies in my daughter's hands this year i mean she's great uh, i you know it's it's not the ultra millionaires tax bill it's the dave lesbron's full employment bill yeah, well, um, you'll be busy, no doubt, with that. Um, uh, another super chat here just from Charlie Brown, just throwing uh, $5 at the show. Thanks for that. He has another one following up saying, 
Uh, I'm Canadian like Rich. I just got 2 million uh, is, sorry, I've just got 2 million is net worth investments, et cetera. In, sorry, in net worth. So is Costa Rica a good option? Thanks for the podcast. It's great. So I guess that like would bring me to the question is who, who should work with a guy like you? And if the line in the sand sits here and Dave deals with these guys, who's going to deal with the guys that have a lower net worth? There, there are. So one of the things to understand first off is, can you live the lifestyle? So, you know, can you spend more than 183 days outside of Canada, mm -hmm. for example, can you spend less than it works? At, it's a percentage of two years last year, this year, 120 days outside of the United States. Uh, can you limit it to 120 days? Um, if you, if you can, then, then we start looking at kind of what the thing, what the thing is. Um, and so there are different advisors and I can, I can send that to you, Rich, who do kind of lifestyle questionnaires. So mm -hmm. ask questions like, you know, I'm going to, you know, I like sun. You know, people often ask me what's the best place to go. Well, some people love big cities. Some people want to be in remote locations. Some people want four seasons. Some people want it you know, 30% uh, Celsius every day. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's a very personal thing. Um, I would often get, uh, you know, hired by somebody just been audited or sued or gone through a divorce and they'll go, okay, move me to a rock in the middle of the ocean where there's no lawyers and no taxes. <laughs> I say, sure, no problem. Pack a gun. Well, why? Well, within six months, either you're going to want to kill yourself or your family's going to want to kill you. Go, oh, no, 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 no. I want schools. I want, you know, I, I want, I, I want a place to ride my motorcycle around on the weekends. I want, you know, I have to have a, an office and some staff. I got to, I've got to, you know, I've got to have a, this kind of bandwidth for my Bloomberg, you know, whatever it is. I need to have, you know, access to a hospital for dialysis, you know, whatever that was say, okay, well, what are the jurisdictions that not only have your, your requirements, but also your preferences. And then amongst those jurisdictions in Costa Rica, I love Costa Rica. I've driven around all four corners of the place, uh, pretty safe. Um, some beautiful places, uh, um, you don't right? want to live in Limon, but you know, there's some really nice places, um, from, from high, you know, uh, San Jose down to the coastal areas. Um, how's it, there's some excellent housing that's built to the standard that a, a, a North American would, would be used to. Uh, pretty easy flights in and out. Um, crime is low. The, the immigration's pretty straightforward. So for that, that question that you had, he's got two million in net worth. So my first question would be, and how much of that is unrealized capital gain? Because you have to contemplate, how do I minimize my capital gain so that I net out the greatest amount of net worth. The next question is, do I need to have that money in, in Costa Rica? And the answer is absolutely not. I mean, uh, I haven't been in the same country as my financial institution in about 15 years. Um, right now I do most of my transactions through TransferWise. Uh, it happens very quick, very quickly. Fees are peanuts. Everything's done by email. Um, I can switch between currencies because I, I do things in euros and sterling, U.S. dollars, Canadian dollars, Aussie dollars. So, you know, it's, it's, it's very good. I mean, I wouldn't stick with the bricks and mortars for my like regular bank account at all. Uh, and I can pay for everything from, you know, buying milk at the local store to my rent. How much um, is the cryptocurrency changing all of that banking stuff right now for us? Well, cryptocurrency is a very interesting, a, a very interesting thing. I've written a couple of pieces about this. So I'm getting a lot of inquiries um, for, from different groups, kind of three different groups. One will be the early adopters um, who got into cryptocurrency. Great for them. I wish I had done the same. I didn't. Um, and who's seen their, you know, the, the values explode. And some of them have just sat on it, sitting in coal wallets, you know, buried in their garage. Uh, other people are actively trading, you know, like they're doing GameStop mm -hmm. uh, back and forth. The tax ramifications are, are, are huge depending on what they've done and which jurisdiction they are and how that's treated. Are they long-term capital gains? Are they short 
short-term, you know, ordinary tax rates? Is it, have they created a taxable event, um, et cetera? All those things need to be happened. Um, and so I get a lot of calls from what I'll call the Bitcoin bros. And so they, they're very steeped in cryptocurrency, but they're not terribly financially sophisticated. So they don't understand capital gains. They don't understand taxable events, those kinds of things. And they may have inadvertently kind of triggered some tax event and they haven't declared it yet. Well, you know, in the United States, there's something called Operation Hidden Treasure. There's a number of different, you know, the, the, the rest of the world has looked at them and say, oh, hidden treasure, great for us, we need it, just at the time for uh, for COVID relief. Um, so, there, so all jurisdictions are going after them, and each jurisdiction, as I said, treats it differently. And so some of them have bought into this, oh, it's the perfect tax haven, they'll never, they'll never find it. And, you know, I said, well, you know, so thought the guys who did the ransomware thing, you know, uh, uh, a little month ago. Well, they located and they seized that Bitcoin. Oh, yes, but I'm using Monero or I'm using mixers. Or I'm using it's so I say to clients, look, you have really kind of an option here. You can put it in a coal wallet, put it in, you know, bury it in your mother's garden and stare at it and say, I'm worth 10 million, but I can't buy a cup of coffee because the second I do, they're going to catch me. And it's kind of like I, you know, I from the movie Goodfellas, it's kind of like they, they had this big heist from Lufthansa, but they couldn't spend any of the money and they all went crazy because they were worried that the cops were going to get them. Hmm. So you don't want that. So then, is, and, and those who kind of, you know, bought stuff and put it on Instagram, well, they're doing lifestyle audits or they brag to their buddies about it. Well, they got whistleblowers. So it's like, if you come in before them, pay the tithe, do it as efficiently as possible, because your options close the second the tax authorities identify you. So if you come in beforehand on your terms and organize it, do it as tax efficiently as possible, pay the minimum amount you possibly can, take the proceeds, organize your life so it's not taxable in the future, you can do very well. So that's one group, the Bitcoin bros. The next group are, Interestingly, family offices for so ultra high net worth families will have family offices, which are let's say ultra high net worth individual. Like, what do they have? Hundred million? Yeah, it, for for a family office, you can you can get into what's called a multiple family office, where where it's it's one group that deals with a variety of different families. But a single family office, a multiple family office, kind of starts making sense at twenty million. Mm -hmm. uh, single family office because you got to hire all your own staff and stuff is kind of a hundred million. And so I, I deal with a lot of family offices. And so what happened there was you had investment people who said, you know what, a millennial in the family was kept bugging us. So we saw, bought some crypto just to shut them up. And oh my God, it's a major check of our assets right now. Mm -hmm. But those, those groups were very sophisticated and understood the, the tax ramifications. So they're going to sell the old stuff that's at, at long-term capital gains as opposed to the stuff they just bought. They're going to buy and hold long-term. They're going to put it in trust. They're going to put it in structures. The last group um, are what I'll call the picks and shovels of the crypto industry. So if you can think back to kind of the early 2000s and online gaming was just becoming a thing. And most of the, well, Lay Vegas, you know, bricks and mortars, they didn't really work a, didn't think about losing, you know, poker players or their sports books. Yeah, this is computer internet thing is kind of a minor thing. Well, I happen to have a lot of American clients who were founders of online gaming companies. And those were the biggest IPOs in the London Exchange in 2005, 2006. So prior to that, there was liquidity events. They hired me. They renounced their U.S. citizenship. And they paid a lower amount of tax upon those things. Well, a year or two later, all of a sudden, gaming became a thing. And Vegas said, oh, they're taking some of our market share. Now, for those who aren't Americans, uh, it's a little difficult to understand. But the U.S. has not only a federal criminal tax system, but each state has its own criminal criminal uh, code. So they could and try so, you twice easily. 
Well, yeah. So the, 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 the people in Vegas, Adelson, et cetera, said, well, we can't get the feds to do it, but we can get the guys in Maryland and South Carolina and a couple of different places to pass laws against particular parts of the business. And it didn't really make much waves until they arrested a British guy who was the CEO of one of these publicly traded companies who was flying from a shareholders meeting in Los Angeles through Dallas Fort Worth on his way to Costa Rica. And they arrested him in Dallas Fort Worth and they gave the guy 17 months. And all of a sudden, all my clients are calling. I go, Dave, I walk onto a football pitch in the UK. I'm applauded. I fly through Newark. I'm arrested. The hell mm -hmm. do I do? I said, well, you know, I happen to know a lot of good extradition lawyers in the UK. It's a, in London. It's a center because of all the Russians in the early 90s. Uh, so I, I just know all those guys. And so I said, okay, well, let's organize the world into green, UK, red, US. But what is Canada? What is Australia? What is France? Is that red, green, or yellow? Because we want to keep you not being arrested. And in the meantime, your corporate lawyers can negotiate as to how you can adjust your business. Because if you're caught, then the power leverage turns and you're in what's called, what we used to call, you're going to get Spitzer after Elliot Spitzer. What he would do is he would go after somebody, he'd arrest the CEO, do the perp walk. Then he'd call up the board, you know, an hour before the bell opened and go, uh, let's make a deal. And they would throw the CEO under the bus, make a deal. So the share the share price. It worked perfectly until he went after AIG and Hank Greenberg said, screw you. I got the money. I'm going to fight this. And what's the one case that Elliot Spitzer lost? AIG. So mm -hmm. don't put yourself in a Spitzer. And so that worked beautifully. Now, what happened was all the people who didn't do that basically went out of business. So all my clients not only didn't get arrested, not only did, were they able to negotiate on good terms, they actually absorbed more market share uh, from, from the, their, their competitors who didn't do that. Now I'm looking at a bit of deja vu with regards to the crypto picks and shovels. You know, uh, BitMEX, Binance, those are exchange issues with regards to anti-money laundering. They're going after or Arthur Hayes, a, a, a BitMEX, for, you know, you haven't got proper KYC, know your client or, or AML, any money laundering procedures in place. And they're throwing the book at them much more than they ever threw at, you know, Deutsche Bank, who actually did money laundering. And so they're going after, after them. They're going after, you know, Arithium, for example, for SEC. Is this a security or not? So, Again, just like our online gaming people, if you uh, another group of my clients are, you know, the key founders and employees for the picks and shovels. And so if you're an investor, one of the things that you want to do is short those who don't recognize that, that, that you know, that the, the regulators are going to come in. And so if you've got a company that's going, that's sitting there flying and has no basically key employee backup plan. That's a good short. All right. Let's, uh, let's finish up on these last few ones here. I got one here from, uh, my friend, Josh renegade Woodman says, great show brothers this is top notch. David, is there a recommended passport, uh, to have that offer the greatest flexibility? Uh, so he's American just for a frame on that. Okay. So, so the best in the world happens to be the Irish. Why? Well, the Irish is, is part of the EU, and under the Treaty of Rome, you have access to 27 different countries. Prior to the formation of the EU and the Treaty of Rome, at the time the Republic of Ireland was, was formed, they have something that none of the other EU countries have, which is something called the Common Travel Arrangement, which means that they have access to the UK, which a Spaniard or a Belgian or an Italian doesn't have. Likewise, Rich, as a UK, if you didn't happen to qualify for a Greek passport and you want, said, I want to plant the seed and maybe, you know, bear the fruit of an EU passport down the road, as an EU national, as a, sorry, UK national, you can get a residence permit in Ireland. If you're a non-EU national and you want that residence permit, you're laying out a thousand euro, or a million euros 
for a, for a, a residence permit, but you're getting it because you hold a British passport. And so, you know, so that's probably a, a European one is a great one to have. Uh, the American has taxation based on it. When you look at them, you're looking for taxation. Um, you're looking at military service if you've got children, and that's an issue. So Israeli citizenship, very easy if you're Jewish under the law of return to make Aliyah. Uh, if you've got children that are going to men and women, um, they, they may want to be in the, in the Israeli Defense Forces, or they may not. But just be aware that that comes along with that. Uh, so the U.S., aside from Eritrea, which they always throw in there for reasons beyond me because there's no equivalent to the IRS in Eritrea, it's the only country which taxes you based on citizenship. Today, and there's some good practical reasons why that is, there was actually an MP, liberal MP from Nepean, who suggested that we have a, uh, uh, that I wrote a blog piece called Monkey See, Monkey Do about Canada adopting a citizenship-based taxation. Not really going to go anywhere. Um, years and years ago, because I did so many Americans expatriating, and they said, well, when y'all going to fall what the United States does and tax based on citizenship? So I wrote our then finance minister, a guy named Paul Martin Jr., all Canadians will know later prime minister, mm -hmm. suggesting this. Why don't we go for citizenship-based taxation? They wrote back a very nice letter, which I still have, which said such a change would be a fundamental and far-reaching change to the Canadian tax system and not one we ever intend on doing. Mm. So never say never, but, you know, there's some practical reasons having to do with the U.S. being the reserve currency, Canada, Australia, Sterling is no longer, um, there's no one country which controls the euro. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. um Josh, if you want to hop on the Zoom afterwards, it's the standard Zoom link that we use for the uh, Q and A's on on Monday. So we're going to be there in about ten minutes or so. So if you want to expand on that, I'll uh, I'll throw you in. Uh, Garen says, "Are retirement taxes generally better outside of the U.S.? I'm currently studying annuities and life insurance for tax free retirement in the U.S. What's the word on that?" So one of the fire prevention methods is something called. Uh, Private Placement Life Insurance, PPLI. Um, I would be careful to make sure that you get a proper advice on that. There's a bunch of PPLI salespeople out there that are, are selling poor products. Uh, there was just a, a very large uh, award that Swiss Life, which was, which is actually a major, quite a major life insurance uh, provider, had to pay. So if you're going to stick with PPLI as a, as a solution, uh, make sure you get good opinions on that, uh, and that it's it, it, it's not it's being sold by a lot of people as you know it'll do wonders it'll put hair back on you know it'll grow my hair my head. And riches, <laughs> um, but, uh, you know uh, you know you know get PPLI call your doctor if you're still hard after four hours but you know it's mm -hmm. it, it's the kind of thing you want to be careful about that it does work but it has to be done properly. There are a lot of fees on that. And you want to compare that to some other solutions. Um, you know, Americans, uh, Rich, again, I, I'm about as close to being an American as you can be without having the big Eagle passport. Mm -hmm. um, but, uh, you know, they've been pledging allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic since they were five years old. They've been sold on the bright, shining city on the hill. Um, you know, they just have something, you know, you can call it indoctrination or whatever that a lot of other countries don't have. Um, you know, the mosaic versus the melting pot kind of concept. So a lot of clients, I can't imagine not living without a U.S. citizenship. So I said, well, I, you know, I've lived my entire life without a U.S. citizenship. I've been okay. Um, well, if you're really wealthy, it's like, well, you know, most of the world billionaires have never had a U.S. passport and they seem to be doing okay. And, <laughs> and so I think that it, most Americans don't even have a passport period though. Yeah. It, 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 and so it's, it's one of the things about getting that distance, overcoming that life inertia, mm -hmm. you know, the Newtonian principle of body and motion tends to stay in motion. Yeah. So a lot of those clients who could never conceive of a possible expatriation a couple of years ago are, are hiring me and they're, and they're saying, quite frankly, I, you know, I would have never known. And it's a bit of a problem because if you're from the Middle East or from the Asia or from Latin America, 
you know, your family's been thinking about alternative citizenships and residences for generations. Mm -hmm. For Canadians and Americans, it's a new topic. And so you want to educate yourself properly because there's a lot of kind of fly by night salespeople out there. And, and you have to understand, is this advisor, you know, independent? I only get paid by my clients. I don't take commissions from projects or governments or, you know, the Irish government doesn't pay me, uh, you know, a, a, a head count for every, you know, Irish grandparent or grandchild I bring in. Um, and so my advice is, you know, I, I would advise somebody, I'll look at your family history first, whereas the salespeople go, no, I'm going to sell you a Portuguese golden visa or a, or a Maltese, you know, residence leading to a citizenship. Why? Well, because it pays them huge commissions. Mm -hmm. They're not going to tell a Brit about the common travel agreement because they're going to want to commission off that million euro investment off the golden visa. So there's lots of opportunities out there, but you really need to, you know, especially when you've got the time, you know, which I was talking just before you start, you know, just isn't anything, you know, low price, speed, quality, pick two. Yeah. So if you've got the time, then you've got, you can have the quality plan at the end of it all, and you can have it a lower price. If you don't have the time, if you're telling me I got to get out before a liquidity event, you know, on Thanksgiving day, well, then you're going to pay a higher price. It's just, you know, the, the, the way it is. So if you've got the time and you've got the runway, definitely take advantage of, of a long-term plan. Uh, all right. So let's do this as the last one. Uh, we have an Anon uh, donation that says, if my parents were born in Haiti, but renounced their Haitian citizenship in the 90s to become U.S. citizenships, citizens, can I apply for a Haitian passport? Well, congratulations. You're still Haitian because the United States has never required you to renounce your, your other citizenship in order to become an American. So, but it's a mythology that's out there. So the, your, your parents can go and apply for their Haitian citizenship. Uh, you as a, as a child of a Haitian, I'm going to assume that you were born in the United States to Haitian born parents, you would be entitled to a, to Haitian passport also. You're going to have to apply for and register for it. They're simply going to show their Haitian uh, birth registration and apply for a new passport. Are there like with um, like, I know with the UK, they've got a lot of islands and colonies, you know, not the world, but with um, Haiti, I think it's a French colony. Like, are you able to get a French uh, passport or like any other country in that sense? Or is that like kind of like backdooring it through uh, like a few other steps? Martinique is a, is a French colony. Haiti had a very famous slave revolution mm -hmm. and became an independent country in the 1700s. Okay. So while it's a, 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 a French former colony, it's an independent country. Got it. Got um, it. So some, so if you look in, in the Caribbean, you'll have independent countries. You'll have what are called British overseas territories like Bermuda Cayman, Turks and Caicos, and Anguilla, uh, Montserrat. You will then have Dutch colonies like the ABC Islands, um, and and you'll have uh, French colonies. Now, the Dutch and the French are considered like provinces of Holland or um, or France. The BOTs, the British Overseas Territories, those are semi-independent countries. Uh, and one of the things I actually did the test case on this um, is that you can qualify for something called a British Overseas Territory Citizenship dash Bermuda, Cayman, Turks, whatever. And if you have that, you are entitled to register for a full UK passport. That is different than a status called belonger status or they, in Cayman, they call it your, your Caymanian or Bermudian. Those mm -hmm. are, are different statuses. And again, you know, if you're going to be looking at those jurisdictions, again, you'll want proper advice so that you know what you're, what you're getting. Okay. All right. Let's wrap it up on that note um, to kind of sign off. I've already put your website in the description of this video. So if you guys are watching it, it's, it's already there. Um, for somebody to contact you, what sort of net worth do they need uh, for it to be worth their while to use your services to help them relocate? Well, if they've got a potential lineage citizenship, um, just if they to, to determine whether they qualify or not uh, is 
uh, is free, for example. Uh, if, we, if they do qualify, then that first stage, can we get a genealogist to prove it? That's going to cost them about $5,000. Mm -hmm. uh, if so, then, and if we apply, let's say it's going to cost by the government fees, et cetera, kind of $20,000. So the question is, is that EU citizenship worth $20,000 to that individual? Mm -hmm. They may not be high net worth, but they may have a child who like uh, Christian Pushilis is going to play in, you know, uh, European soccer, um, or they may want to do something, you know, that way. Um, so you can have somebody who's, you know, middle class, uh, lower upper class that, that can do it. For the client who's going to, um, ex you know, leave their current tax system, you know, you're looking at kind of it making sense, um, for having at least, you know, a two million, say, the, 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 the chap that, that mentioned it about Costa Rica, that's a, a client. Again, very straightforward uh, client for me. Uh, where I really, you know, earn my, uh, my keep is for people who are, are higher net worth or, or who are leaving jurisdictions where it's much more difficult. Quite mm -hmm. frankly, Canadians are easy for me. Americans are a lot more, a lot trickier, um, and we need a bigger team of people. And the more complicated their stuff. So if you're somebody who says, you know, all I have in the world is everything's on a portfolio, and I can tell you exactly what it's worth by firing up my Bloomberg, that's different than somebody who's got, you know, home, second home part of a family property, privately held company, portfolio, 401k, charitable remainder trust, they got all kinds of different stuff. You know, that client, you know, is going to really need some sophisticated help that, you know, that I would bring in on this team. That sounds good. So there you have it, guys. I hope you enjoyed the cast. Give it a, uh, a big thumbs up. Um, and if you have any experience, feel free to uh, chop it up in the chat after the video's uh, done. Um, Dave, I dropped the, uh, link to join me on the zoom in the private chat. So just open that up in a separate, separate window and I'll join you there in like a minute. Okay. We'll you see you. Great. Sounds good. Thanks. Rich. All right. See you guys.